Thank you, Brent. I appreciate that. Now we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to talk about uh, fleet risk management best practices here. Uh, and there are certain activities that we've identified that we want to be uh, doing that we recommend highly that you be participating in uh, in managing your fleets uh, and, and trying to prevent accidents, car accidents, injuries that result uh, from fleets, uh, operating fleets. And one of the things that, you know, we look at, of course, is the cost of claims that happen. It can be really significant. Uh, we've had single events that have gone into tens of millions of dollars, and that's definitely something you want to make sure you're covered on. But most importantly, those are events that we want to make sure that we're preventing, if at all po possible. In 2012, the trust had almost $6 million uh, worth of auto-related uh, claims, and that's something that really uh, we, we couldn't do that every year. And so it's up to you as members of the trust to, to put the controls in place to make sure that we don't have years like that. Even in 2013, it was two and a, almost two and a half million dollars. In 2014, better year, still not anything I'm jumping up and down and all excited about. You know, it's still close to a million dollars for auto-related claims in 2014. And so this is really something that we all need to be working together on uh, to make sure that we have some control of. Uh, who controls this risk? You know, it's, it, is it the supervisor? Is it the driver? Is it the manager? Is it the entity, you know, whoever's the, the chief executive officer of your entity? Who's really in control of these risks? And of course, the answer is everybody has to take a different degree of responsibility. Yeah, the driver has to be safe. He has to be trained. He has to be dedicated to being a safe driver. The supervisor has to be observing, has to know what's going on. You know, do you, are you aware that your drivers are unsafe or are, they, are you certain they're safe drivers because you're actually paying attention to what they're doing and you're doing some observations, making sure that they're following policy and procedures that you have in place. The employer has control over a lot of things. It starts out, you know, even with selection of the vehicles, you know, what are our maintenance programs looking like? You know, who is going to be responsible, you know, for drivers and supervision? And so every single one of us in the organization plays a role in controlling these risks. So it's really important that the frontline control, of course, is going to be the driver. However, if I'm the person who's hiring the driver, I have a role to play too. So who is driving our vehicles? Do we just say that everybody who works for uh, our organization is authorized to drive a vehicle? Or do we take a little extra look at people and determine whether they need to be driving and do they merit the privilege of driving a vehicle for work? So it could be employees that we have that are authorized drivers. It could be volunteers that we have in our organization that are authorized drivers. Uh, and sometimes this even extends to elected officials. And we get a lot of questions about elected officials and driving. Uh, your elected official, if they're authorized to drive a vehicle, that of course is an exposure. But even volunteers and elected officials if they're driving their private vehicles on city business or district business or county business, they're still, there's a potential liability exposure there, even if they're driving their own vehicle, because if they're operating that vehicle while conducting business on behalf of the entity, there is a, an open door there. There is potential exposure. So we need to be looking at who we're authorizing. Now, with elected officials, of course, you know, we don't determine who they are. That's the ballot box. And so there's a little less control there. But especially with employees and volunteers that we select who are going to be driving as part of their functions, we definitely need to have some controls in place and be looking at that. So when we're looking at our driver selection process, we need to identify what qualifications, what qualifies someone to operate a vehicle, to drive for work for our organization. And that's something that we need each one of you to identify and put in place. You may have heard us talking in the past about a driver qualification policy or program. 
And that's important that we actually sit down and look at, okay, how are we going to select a driver? Who are we going to authorize? What are the qualifications they need to meet? And so there's a lot of different things that we suggest. Maybe a driving test. If you're going to be hiring someone and driving is going to be part of their job, maybe in, in that process of selecting that candidate, we take them on a driving test and see what kind of a driver they are. We also look at their driving record. We evaluate their motor vehicle record. And this is for employees and for volunteers as well. Even if they can go out and drive in a driving test nice and safe for us, you know, they, you know, maybe being very extra careful, you know, about how they're driving, you know, so that they can get the job. Lots of people will look at me and they say, well, I can't look at someone's, you know, driving record and tickets that they got, you know, on their own personal time in their own personal vehicle and apply it to work. You know, that wouldn't be fair. And I'm actually going to contradict that. It's very fair. We drive and we have habits when we drive. And the, and the kind of driver I am, whether I'm on the clock or off the clock, is pretty much the same. I don't change a whole lot how I drive. And I think that's probably true for everybody. And if someone can be that conscientious to be a different driver on the job, they can be a, a better driver all the time. And so we're telling you that we really recommend that you look at their driving record. If someone has a lot of tickets on their driving record, that's indicative of someone who is more likely to have an accident, whether they're on the job or not. It's part of what would qualify them for a job, just like any skill that they bring to the job or any training that they get outside and that they bring to the job with them. So identify what you are going to use as a qualification. In the past, what we've seen a lot is just people saying, well, they have a valid Utah driver's license. That's, that's all we need. We, we really want to take that to the next step higher. We want to make sure that we are putting people behind the wheel that have exhibited good driving skills, good driving records, because those will be safer drivers, and they are less likely to have accidents, as I'll show you here in just a few minutes. This is when we first started recommending this, uh, we showed you this metric, you know, of that's just a suggestion of ways to, you know, put on a chart someone's driving history and determine whether they meet a qualification or not. So this is, could be something, an example of something that you may use in qualifying a driver. It could be something that's just in a policy uh, that you use to identify who could be a qualified driver. So this is kind of uh, similar to what we currently use as uh, a, a sample driver qualification policy. Now, I'd like to stress that this sample doesn't mean that this is exactly what we expect everybody to adopt. You can change it to fit your organization. We're not, you know, telling you exactly what these policies need to look like, but there are suggestions. And we really do want you to be looking at the MVR and have some sort of idea of what things you're going to see on the MVR that are going to qualify someone or not. And if you like this policy, this sample, and you want to use it, that's great as well. But we really want to be looking at how many tickets do they have on their record? Uh, can we find out, you know, what their history of at-fault accidents are? Uh, do they have a history of serious violations? Have they, do they have a, a DUI in the last year or in the last couple of years? Uh, that may influence our decision to qualify this person to drive a vehicle for us. So number one, know what qualifies a driver. Have a policy in place that you're using that uh, drivers are qualified. A lot of you are members of our driver monitoring program where we keep an eye on those MVRs for you every month. And, it's, and you need to use that information in order to make these decisions uh, to have your drivers behind the wheel. But just because, you know, your in our MBR monitoring program doesn't mean you submit all your employees. You only need to submit the people that you've decided are actual drivers. You know, that's really what we're doing here is we're trying to control our auto liability and property damage risk here. So do we need the employee's permission to do an MBR on them? That's a question that comes up a lot. Uh, 
And when we are running MVRs for government entities or when a government entity is running an MVR, if it is part of your normal government operations to do that function, that does not require uh, the driver's permission for you to run that MVR. So since we are all government entities and identifying who's authorized to drive our government vehicles or drive vehicles on government business, then running that MVR to make that selection is part of a normal function, operating function. So we actually don't need to have those permission slips. If these are people that are authorized to drive for you, we you know need to be looking to see what uh, you know what's what's in there. What what kind of drivers are they? What about their privacy? And that's and people may be concerned about this because we want your drivers to know that we're looking at their driving record. That's an incentive for them to keep their driving record clean. They know it's it's being monitored. Uh, is there private personal information in there that's getting out? And of course, the answer to that question is no. In fact, the only people here that off that access that information actually have gone through a background check. We have background checks run on us before we access that information. We're fingerprinted and everything. And so we control that information very carefully. Uh, personal identification information isn't really that available on these MVRs either. You don't even see on an MVR printout, you don't even see the entire driver's license number. It only shows four of the digits of the nine digits of a driver's license number. It doesn't show your home address. I mean, there's all sorts. We don't see hardly any of that personal identifying information except maybe a birthday, which is still private information, and that is why we go to great lengths to make sure we control who is accessing that information. So you are sharing that with us. You have control of it, and we make sure that uh, very few people have access to that information here, and they've all been background checked. So that privacy is protected. Do we include elected officials? Yeah. You know, do we have as much control over elected officials? No, but we should know if they are a real serious risk so that we can try and take steps with them to address that exposure. What if we don't own any vehicles? Again, the risk is still there because even if you don't own any vehicles, if your entity doesn't own any vehicles, you're probably still driving on business for your entity. You're going to the post office, you're going to the market to pick up supplies, you know, you're going and attending a training or a class or a meeting somewhere. That's driving a vehicle on your entity's business and that still has an exposure there regardless of whether you own the vehicle or not. So we if you don't have a fleet of vehicles, you still should be looking at what qualifies someone to, to be authorized to drive on city, district, you know, business for you. Other questions, you know, is it our business if someone gets a ticket off the clock? And I, and I already mentioned, you know, that is an indicator of what kind of a driver they are. We're qualifying them. We're deciding whether they're a safe enough driver to be operating a vehicle on, on our business or, or for us. And so, yes, it is our business what kind of a driver they are, you know, especially when we're putting them behind the wheel. And so, absolutely, yes, do drivers change their habits when they're not on the clock? Possibly, but as a general rule, you know, we're the same driver on or off the clock. So what our driving record looks like, you know, it really, it, our habits don't really change. So hopefully, you know, they might change from vehicle to vehicle, but in general, our driving habits are the same no matter what. Here's an example of what an MVR looks like. So I was just kind of telling you about the privacy issues. This is actually my MVR. So I'm out, I'm sharing it here with everybody. So the biggest thing on here that you might pick up off of this is when my driver's license expires, you notice it's expired. That's because I printed this MVR a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do have a valid driver's license now, but it shows, you know, my name, my birthday, that's it. There's no address, there's no social security number. It doesn't have the complete driver's license number. And we still guard this information and uh, protect it. So. What should be included in our driver qualification program? Well, we want to make sure that we're at least looking at our driver's driving records annually. If you're in the trust MVR monitoring program, we're looking at it monthly. But you should at least look at your drivers annually. And lots of times if you have drivers and they're operating on an out-of-state license, which isn't that unusual, we have, uh, you know, in 
some of us that are near borders, whether we're up in Cache County, Box Elder County, Grand County, uh, Washington, uh, Kanab, these areas, you may have people who work for you who live in another state. And so we have out of state licenses. And so we recommend that you check those, you know, at least annually uh, if we can't get those states' records to work in our system. Uh, but as a general rule in our program, we're monitoring them monthly. You should look at new hires and determine whether they're going to be driving and whether their driving skills and record merit uh, that position. Uh, accidents, you know, are people having accidents? And on the NVR, it doesn't necessarily show us that, that people have had accidents. But as an employer, if we've had accidents on the job, you know, we should be aware of that and keeping track of that. You know, if, if an employee is averages an, an accident every year, that person's not a good risk. And so we should also be paying attention to how many at-fault accidents people have and get out there and make observations. You know, what kind of drivers are they? Do they come to a complete stop? Do they wear their seatbelt? You know, and you could uh, come up with a checklist of things that we want to, we can just really quickly do and observe our drivers when we see them driving. Uh, to make sure that they are following policies and procedures and being safe drivers. The Trust MBR program, you know, we can help you with pre-hire MBR checks. So if you're thinking about hiring someone, you want to know what, what their driving record looks like, we can use our program also to get you that information. Uh, like I said, we do a monthly monitoring of the drivers in our program. We send you a report every month to let you know if your driver's records have changed, if they've gotten any new tickets in the last month and so forth. And there's no cost to you as a member at all. And this is a great benefit. If you're a private employer and you want to get an MVR check done on a driver, it costs like $9 to get that MVR report. And so you know, by using our program, that's saving a lot of money so as we are able to do that at no cost because we are with the government. Uh, MBR program benefits helps you control your risks. You know if you've got a driver who is particularly risky, and I'll show you some statistics in a minute that will help you, you know, quantify what that risk is, how much risk that is that we're dealing with with different drivers. It helps to know if, so, if the driver actually has a valid driver's license. You'd be surprised how often we find people whose licenses have expired and they haven't renewed them. And you, and you want to make sure if you're putting someone behind the wheel as part of their employment with you that they're, they've got a valid driver's license. That could be really embarrassing. Uh, and make sure if they're a CDL operator that their CDL status is valid. And you find that out from our monthly report as well. Identify training needs. And so you see a driver, maybe they've had accidents, maybe they got their driving record is getting up there where, you know, it's getting a little worse. Maybe we can get some inter intervention going, some defensive driver training or something we may identify as necessary. And also let your drivers know that as a driver of the, the district, city, county, that their driving records are being monitored and there is a standard that they need to meet in order to you know, be qualified to drive on your business. And that hopefully motivates drivers to help keep their driving records good and clean. Uh, what we found is that, uh, you know, in our program over the last couple of years as we've been doing this, we've actually collected, or not collected, but we're helping you, our members, monitor over 12,000 drivers right now. And actually it needs to be more. The, the Utah Local Governments Trust actually has is requiring that if you are in our liability program that you let us know who your drivers are also as your insurer we have a right to know who we are insuring and uh, and so there may be a few of you out there still that haven't got in the program yet and you're covered by our liability program we really need that that driver information so if you're not in this driver program yet your liability coverage is through the trust let us know because we need to we need to make sure we know who's driving those vehicles out there out of these 12,000 drivers currently there are 3,000 violations, tickets, license status issues uh, from those 12,000 drivers. A lot of those, you know, are attributed to more than one driver. Our actual viol violator rate 
at the in this whole pool of drivers is 14%. In other words, only 14% of those 12,425 drivers have anything on their license at all. No, I mean, as far as tickets or anything. The vast majority of the people that we have working for us and driving for us have excellent driving records. And so when we're talking about monitoring our drivers and their driving records, we're not talking about, you know, getting after the vast majority or even half of our drivers. You know, it's only about 15% of our drivers out there who have any tickets on their record. And if they have one ticket, I'm still not really that concerned about one or even two tickets. It's not till we get up to like three or more or four or more that the the red flags start going up for me. So, and that's, the, and the vast majority of our drivers are already great. They have awesome, clean driving records, not even a single ticket on them. Uh, also, what we have found though, is that, um, you know, we'll have about 12% of these drivers that have one ticket on their record. So if we do the math there, we're looking at 97% of our drivers have one ticket or less. And so again, the vast majority of our drivers we're not too concerned about. In fact, if we go up to two tickets, now we're talking about 99% of these 12,425 drivers have zero, one, or two tickets on their record. And in my personal opinion, you know, even up to two tickets, you know, shouldn't disqualify anybody, even though I want to see perfectly clean driving records. So between when we go above that, three tickets or more, so three violations is about eight-tenths of a percent. Uh, people with four violations on their records is about one-tenth of one percent or one in 500 drivers have that many tickets on their record. And drivers with five or more violations on their record are another you know, one tenth, and so we're we're looking at about you know those five or more. There, that's that's one in a thousand, you know, that we're looking at there. And so, this is kind of how it breaks down. We're not looking to get after the vast majority of our drivers about their driving skills. It's a small minority that we're really you know looking at as can be identified clearly as higher risk drivers that we need to make some decision about how we're going to handle those. Also, we found hundreds as we over the last few years as we, as we monitored uh, driving records for our members, we found hundreds of invalid licenses, people who had suspended, uh, expired, you know, otherwise invalid licenses. And in a lot of these cases, the drivers themselves didn't even know that their license was uh, in an invalid status. And so by doing this, we're not just making a decision on who should be driving, but we're helping our drivers too make sure that they have valid licenses. And and I'm not kidding, when we go through these, it, on average, one to two percent of all the new drivers that are put into the monitoring program will have an invalid license. And uh, that that's really not insignificant, especially when we're talking about over 10,000 drivers. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not putting people behind the wheel who don't have valid driver's licenses. So what is the risk? I told you that we, I would tell you how to quantify, you know, this risk of, of someone who's likely to have an accident in the future. And so what does the MVR tell us about this risk? Well, if you have prior citations in, in the prior three years, we have actually can point to studies that have weighed this out. If you have one ticket on your license, you are 49% more likely to have an accident in the next three years than someone who has a clean driving record. So even with one ticket on there, there is a measurable increase in the risk of that person having an accident. If there's two tickets on someone's driving record, they are 86% more likely to have an accident in the next three years. Uh, with three tickets, it's more than double. You're more than twice as likely to have an accident in the next three years. With four tickets, 136% more likely to have an accident in the next three years. And at five, uh, you know, we're about three times more likely to have an accident in the next three years. And so we can see that the more tickets someone has on their MVR, the more likely they are to potentially have an accident. And that's a measurable risk that we can identify 
and put controls in place. And that's what we really want to do. And of course, with, if you got someone who has six tickets, chances are that person's about to lose their license anyway, the way the point system works. But it's possible. I've seen them, you know, I've seen more than that that actually still had valid licenses. And so, you know, this person, 212% uh, more likely to have an accident than someone with a clean driving record. If we're keeping track of accidents that our employees have had, if someone has had one at-fault accident in the previous three years, again, it's about like a, a, a speeding ticket. They're about 50%, 63% more likely to be in another accident in the next three years. If someone's had two at-fault accidents in the last three years, they're 150% more likely to have an accident, another accident in the next three years. If they've had three at-fault accidents in the prior three years, if they're averaging one a year, they're about 200% more likely or three times as likely to have another accident in the next three years. So again, that's something we can pay attention. That's something we can measure, especially if these accidents are happening on the job. Someone had a fender bender out in the public works shop or you know, something like that, that it's happening on the job, we can keep track of these. And you definitely can take action on whether someone is qualified to drive a vehicle for you if they keep having accidents. That's a definite qualifier or disqualifier. Next thing we want to talk about in managing our auto risks isn't just the driver selection. That whole first section was about driver selection, but we also want to talk about managing distractions. We all know that driver distraction is a major contributor to uh, motor vehicle accidents. And there's three types of distractions that happen when we're behind the wheel. You know, if I were doing just a class on defensive driving and driver distraction, we would talk about the cognitive, the visual and the manual distractions. What are the things that take our mind off, off driving? What are the things that take my eyes off the driving task? And what are the things that take my hands away from the wheel or away from the driving task? And these are all things we need to be considering. And there are certain activities that we can control, that we can put controls in place and adopt policies and procedures to help us, you know, have controls over these different risks. For example, cell phones or any mobile devices. Uh, and of course, I recommend that you not just have a cell phone policy, but that you have a mobile device policy. It should cover, you know, iPods, iPads, iPhones, cell phones, you know, whatever it is. You know, we should have a policy for this. If you have someone who's using a mobile device while they're operating a vehicle, they are experiencing a distractive, a distraction that covers all three of these types of distractions. It's, it's cognitive, you know, that's taking their mind off of the task. It takes their eyes off the task and it can take their hands off the task to manipulate the device. And so that's a serious type of risk. In fact, people who are using a mobile device while they're driving are four times as likely to be in a crash, you know, as a result of that distraction. It is the equivalent of having a blood alcohol content of 0 .08, which is the legal limit. And so operating a mobile device and driving is like driving drunk. Uh, so turn off the phone. Have a policy in place for your drivers that says, you know, phones should be off, that you should not be using the phone, should not be making phone calls while you're driving. And of course, we've put together some sample policies in the past that talk about, you know, some wording that can be used for that kind of policy. But you should really be controlling that mobile device use. Again, someone's texting while they're driving. All three types of distraction, cognitive, visual, and manual. When someone sends or receives a text message and they're checking it and responding to it, on average, they'll take their eyes off the road for at least five seconds while they're doing that. At 60 miles an hour, five seconds, you move 440 feet. That's a long way to travel while your eyes aren't on the road. And texting while driving is a blood alcohol content equivalent of 0.16, two times the legal limit. So we really want to control our employees, you know, using devices while they're driving, while they're behind the wheel. Not to say anything to about laws that we now have on the books about that being a violation if we're manipulating a, a device while we're driving.
Other types of dis distractions that can happen behind the wheel is eating. It is a cognitive distraction. I'm thinking about that French fry that I want to get out of the bag. I'm thinking, where's that French fries? Even if I keep my eyes on the road, I'm down there and I'm digging in the bag and I'm searching around for that French fry. And my mind is like, where did it go? And so it's a cognitive distraction. There is a greater risk of, of crash. In fact, when you're reaching for an object while you're driving, your risk of crash is triples while you're reaching for an object, you know, even if it's just a stationary object, reaching for a drink or something that's in the cup holder, that triples your risk of crash at that time. If you're reaching for something that's moving, like your drink is tipping over, you know, or you dropped your sandwich over on the, on the floor and you're reaching over trying to get that, that increases your risk of crash by nine times. It's a huge risk to try and reach and grab something that's sliding or moving. And so, you know, eating is just one example of when that, uh, those types of distractions may come into play. Another thing we really need to think about is not just whether we have accidents or not, but if we have accidents, can we control how severe they are? Unfortunately, we lose employees to vehicle crashes, you know, and uh, it's something that we see, you know, throughout the pool. And in lots of cases, many, many times, these are preventable. In fact, in 2014, of all fatalities that happened on Utah highways, if you uh, don't count pedestrian and bicycle and motorcycles, things that happen outside of the car. If you look at fatalities, it just happened to pass passengers of a automobile inside of a, a passenger compartment of a vehicle. 44% of those people were not wearing seatbelts. Only 17% of drivers in Utah as a whole don't wear their seatbelts. And that's kind of a bad number. Actually, the national average is much lower than that. And we used to be better. But in the last couple of years, our seatbelt usage has declined a little bit. And so we really need to kind of get together and, and try and get people wearing their seatbelts again, because we have lost a couple of percentage points. But even at that, if we have 44% of fatalities happening with people who aren't belted, but only 17% are unbelted, those who die are in a minority. Don't be in the minority that contributes to the majority of fatalities. Wear that seatbelt. It takes a couple of seconds, and it really does increase your ability to survive an accident if it does happen. So, and it's measurable. In fact, there was this metric I found a couple of years ago. This was shows to 2010, but it's really interesting because you see on this graph, as seatbelt usage goes up, you can see back in 1994, seatbelt usage was about 58%. Today, it's in the neighborhood of 85%. But you see those daytime unrestrained, you know, fatalities from people, occupants of vehicles, unrestrained, not wearing a seatbelt fatalities, there's a direct correlation. The more seatbelt use, the fewer people die in cars when they're when they're in an accident and it's a direct relationship so if we want to you know do one thing that will help save a life if we do have an accident it's make sure that people are wearing their seatbelt have a policy that requires your employees to wear seatbelts when they're in or operating your vehicles. And that's something that's really easy to go out and do an observation. When I see one of our people driving their truck or a vehicle around town, I see them, are they wearing their seatbelt? You know, make a note of that. And if they're not, then it's something that needs to be addressed. Another thing that's really important to safe operation of a fleet is the maintenance of those vehicles and the condition of those vehicles. So how often, do we look at our vehicles and look to see whether they're in safe operating condition? Hopefully, it's every day. Uh, if, uh, if we're operating heavy trucks, there should be a pre-trip inspection every time that driver gets in that heavy truck. However, even with passenger vehicles and pickup trucks, we should be doing regular inspections on those vehicles. So. Have a policy uh, to make sure that your vehicles are getting inspected on a regular basis, whether that's every day they're driven or weekly. You know, if they're vehicles that don't get used that often, make sure that we're putting an eyeball on them. So here's an example of a checklist that could be used for a heavy truck and trailer uh, to pre-trip inspection. Or 
Here's one that could just be used on a regular passenger vehicle or a pickup truck. You know, are the lights all working? Are the wipers working? What do the tires look like? You know, are we getting down on the tread wear? You know, even before you get down to two thirty seconds of an inch of tread, which is where legally they're worn out, that vehicle is, is already in a situation where when you have to stop at an emergency, it will take longer to stop. As, as a general rule with most tires, the less tread on them, the longer it takes them to stop. So there is a hazard there. So when we start to get down, you know, under five, four, 30 seconds of an inch, definitely at three, 30 seconds of an inch, we need to be looking at, hey, it's time to replace these tires. You know, is the horn working? You know, do we have, is, are the brakes, how are the brakes working? You know, are there, and this actually requires driving the vehicle. You know, do you feel any pulsating in the brake pedal or in the steering wheel when you hit the brake? Does it pull one way or the other when you hit the brake? You know, are there, are there any noises, any squealing noises or grinding noises when we hit the brake? These are things that we don't just ignore. We need to make sure that we're following up on those and these vehicles are staying maintained. And so a good regular safety check of all vehicles, including trailers. We've had some really bad accidents with trailers coming loose. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're doing inspections on the trailer hitches and safety chains as well. Um, what does the future hold for you? Is there a multi-million dollar automobile crash in your future? Uh, is there a fatal automobile crash in your future? These are things that hopefully I've given you just a little bit of a flavor. There are ways to identify and quantify these risks that are associated with these accidents. And there's things, very specific things that we can do to control these risks and keep them from, ha from having them uh, in our organizations. What are you doing to prevent it currently? If, as we talked about these things today, you know, are you doing all of these? Are these part of your fleet management, risk management program? And if they're not, let's put, so let's think about it and, uh, and think about adding those because each one of these uh, things that we've talked about today represent measurable, quantifiable risks that we're, we're accepting when we operate a fleet. Am I being reasonable and prudent? When I have an employee out there and they get in a, in a, in a multi-million dollar accident or when they're in a fatal accident, you know, is someone going to come in, which is probably going to happen. They're going to look at how you did a driver selection, look at how you're, you know, maintaining your vehicles. You know, were you reasonable and prudent in you know, who you chose to put behind the wheel, how you selected your vehicles, how you maintained your vehicles, you know, and controlled the risks associated with those accidents. And when it does happen, you know, there probably will be a camera in your face or in somebody's face asking you potentially uncomfortable questions if we haven't checked all these boxes. So in summary, driver qualification policy really accept the, the, the serious responsibility of putting safe drivers behind the wheel, not just legal drivers, but safe drivers behind the wheel. Make sure we have a policy and we train our employees not to use mobile devices while they're in the vehicle behind the wheel. I don't know if you need to have a food policy, but it, at least training, make sure people understand that hazard associated with reaching for objects, you know, while they're driving and the distraction that is. Uh, one thing and I, I didn't really touch on, I usually touch on a little bit more, but like with the mobile device policy, also just conversations when people are behind the wheel talking, you know, create a distraction. I did a, I went to a family reunion this weekend, drove to Northern California with my wife and one of my kids, and we were having this really in-depth conversation about philosophy. And uh, my son was sharing some information from a philosophy class he had had, and it was a really fascinating discussion we were having. And as we were having this discussion, we drove right past our destination. And we went about 20 or 30 miles past our destination before we figured out, you know, we were lost. And that was because I was engaged in this conversation while I was driving, and it was a distraction. It's not just mobile devices. You know, drivers getting in deep conversations when they're driving is also a distraction. And so that's something as a matter of training to make sure we talk about as well. Seatbelt policies, extremely measurable, quantifiable risk there. Make sure everybody's wearing the seatbelt, even if they're only in the vehicle for a few minutes. They need to wear those seatbelts. Make sure our vehicles are safe. Conduct regular, frequent inspections of our vehicle to make sure we're on top of any maintenance issues that may impact the safety 
of that vehicle and make sure that they are properly maintained. So if anybody has any questions about this, feel free to contact me. Uh, you can contact Jason or Brent as well. Our email addresses are first name at utahtrust.gov. So I'm Doug at utahtrust.gov. And our phone number here at the office, which will get us, will get you in touch with us wherever we are, unless we're in another meeting or something, uh, 936-6400. Uh, if we're not at our desk, that will get forwarded to our, our cell phones and we'll get in touch with you as soon as we can. Uh, so, is there any questions out there? I'm not seeing any questions. How about you, Brent? See any questions? Oh, no, I don't see any questions. Good job, Doug. Good points on that. Okay, we appreciate everybody tuning in. I hope this was helpful. And let us know if you have any questions about policies or procedures or the MVR monitoring program or driver qualification program. Those are actually important parts of the Trust Accountability Award program as well. So, uh, make sure you're taking a look at it and let us do whatever we can to, to help you out with it. Thank you very much. Have a great day.